Um, we had done uh, the Catholic case um, last lecture. Uh, now we're going to do Hindu and Islamic social justice. And right from the get-go, if you're Muslim, you may have trouble with the title of my first slide. The problem is, is that I've, talk, I've talked to several Muslims and some scholar types about putting this lecture together. And the problem they tell me is, is that in the Islamic case, it is not always normal to use the term social justice. It just doesn't ring right. Some people use, for instance, the word ethics. They'll just say ethics. Okay? So I recognize there's a problem there, but there's not a consistency. The, the, the written materials I relied on for putting together material in the book and in this lecture do use social justice. Okay? So there's not an agreement, apparently, within um, the broader Islamic community on even the terminology. One of the problems may be is that actually uh, social justice has Christian, the term social justice has Christian roots. Um, it didn't, it, so it's, it's not, there's always with language there's issues like this. Um, so with respect to um, the Hindu case, um, what I'm going to start on is the, with the caste system. Um, so what this was originally set up to do um, is to divide labor per skills and aptitudes. Now. Earlier on in um, history in India, there was, it was it, from my reading, it said it was a very egalitarian um, society um, before this idea set up. And it was not set up with some sort of uh, any bad intent. It was just to sort of, you have these people and you want to split them up in terms of their skills and aptitudes, and that was that. Okay? Um, so caste is a stratification of social classes with hierarchical closed layers. And we'll, we'll, we'll explain what those two words mean hierarchical and closed, so these are like social rankings. And there can be cases where the social content, contact between the layers is limited, and where the mobility, that is your ability to go from one layer to the next, is limited, okay? Um, over time, apparently what happened over many years, this sort of became viewed on um, the caste system as um, natural and God-ordained. Okay, and, and it became institutionalized okay, as, as a system. So the hierarchy goes something like this in broad outlines. There's the Brahmins at the top. These are the educators, trainers, priests, theologians, and philosophers. So these priests would advise the rulers. They provided military training and were often military commanders, and they governed the land. Okay, this is the highest class, so to speak. Um, I can't pronounce the next word. Uh, go ahead. That's Shatriya. Okay, what he said. Um, <laughs> rulers, defenders from enemy attacks, the military and administrators, they govern the land also. Um, Vashayas, is that close enough? How what? Vashayas? No, that's Vaishas. Vaishas. Yeah. Vaishas were producer of wealth and, pro wealth and prosperity, the businessmen, or, well, um, traders, professionals. So these are merchants and traders who would provide them financial aid to su support for governance and for the military. Okay. So we're going down the hierarchy now. Um, then there's the, the shudras, um, or artisans, um, service providers, and laborers. So these people uh, at the bottom were exempt from military service, and they would provide resources for the higher levels. Okay. So in villages, they would provide support services um, to everyone as barbers, blacksmiths, water drawers, potters, skinners, and midwives. And they receive, these laborers receive money or a portion of the harvest crop. Okay, so this is sort of uh, the lower classes. Okay, now, so over time, this, is, this system is institutionalized. And basically, you spend your life at one level. Okay, and that's that. Now, one of the problems um, in many people's views is that the shoe dress are discriminated against, exploited, treated harshly, or socially or economically disadvantaged. We're going to come back to that. And then there's this complicated thing of subcasts. Um, and uh, one of the subcasts would include conquered people, servants, and invaders. Um, and then there's another level at the bottom, apparently, the Adi shoe dress. Um, and, uh, that are at the absolute bottom, viewed as less civilized. They're tribes of the forest and hill people, and they're called the untouchables, or the Ashut. Achut. Achut. 
um, the untouchables. Um, so typically they would live at the periphery of a village or in seclusion. They're not allowed to drink from the same water sources, including a river. Um, they live in the worst socioeconomic conditions, and today the, the untouchables are called Dalits. So it, the best data I could find on the Dalits was in the 2001 India census. Um, there's 25% of the population, um, so roughly 250 million people that are Dalits, or the untouchables. Okay. Um, now, at the same time, there's other things going on in Hinduism. There's this notion of Dharma. So Dharma is, is sort of a religious code of behavior and a divine system of morality and righteousness and um, a confirmation to one's cosmically allotted duty in nature. And it is related to social justice. In particular, the statement from what I found in the literature says that Dharma denotes the sustaining of principles of social harmony through <laughs> preservation, progress, and the welfare of humanity without excluding anyone. Okay, so in my readings, I find contradictions in a sense. Okay, we're going to come back to some of those contradictions later when we talk about Amartya Sen's um, system of justice, and he, he he talks about the nitty and the on the ayah. I don't know how to pronounce that either. Um, but then there's the issue of doctrines of rebirth. Okay, and car the issue of karma. So. This is the Hindu explanation of suffering, early death, poverty, and caste inequality. So the idea is that persons of low caste class, um, they committed a negative karmic act in a previous life that resulted in their present low status in society. In other words, they were born into their class because they, I don't know how to use the right, what's the right term, but they did something bad in a previous life. Okay? And, uh, um, so there, the, you, you, you take a different view of life uh, if you believe that you're reborn, right? So it, it's uh, in, in that your previous life, life can affect your current life. Um, this is used to justify the terrible conditions that many people live in under India. And it's used to legitimize, make legitimate the class structure. Now, however, there's an opposing view. Um, the religion accorded proper recognition to individual merits and virtues irrespective of a person's caste. So on the one hand, when, when I'm reading, it comes back and I'll say all this caste, the untouchables, and I'll come back and talk about dharma, and I'll come back and talk about karma in different lights. Um, so it, it really comes down, it's quite complicated. Um, now, there's been a number of modern reform movements um, with respect to the caste system and with respect to gender issues in India. Gender issues, if you've watch, been watching the news last year or two, are a big issue in India. Okay. Um, so first one is uh, the Swami uh, Dayananda, um, who said that the heredity caste system was evil, that women were equal to men, and the categorization of people was, as untouchables was sinful. Another person says he, he opened his temples to all. He declared the untouchables equal. Um, said that widows should be allowed to remarry. So when you look at these reform movements, you say, what? You mean they're not allowed to remarry? Well, this is a very foreign idea to many people. Okay? But this is an issue in India that, that a woman, uh, if her husband dies, is not necessarily allowed to remarry. I, my understanding of that, though, is, is that would depend on what region of India you're in? Yes. Yes, okay. And, uh, and with respect to the caste system, the region of India, I've had a number of graduate students from India over the years, they always tell me, well, in this city, that's uh, this whole caste system has really died away. Is, is that an accurate statement? It's, it's like it's very really diversified everywhere. Like it's, it's very different. You yeah. go to a particular part and you, like especially the rural areas, the states which are more into agriculture and not uh, have a lot of urbanization going on are the states where you would find more of these caste systems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and then it, he pursued a policy of education for all, especially women. Then there's the Brahmo. Um, he opposed sati. Now, the sati thing is really a tough thing. So this is the notion that a woman should be burned on the funeral pyre with her husband when he dies. Okay, this is still going on, in particular in one. Um, well, state in India. Uh, my understanding, though, uh, this is 
absolutely against the law. I mean, this isn't okay, but it it, it is happening, right? Is that? I I haven't heard of that some something like that recently, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, and I've heard of it only in one state in my reading. Um, and opposing the discrimination against widows, of course, um, Gandhi um, said, in quoting him, uh, he declared the treatment of untouchables to be a great blot on Hinduism. Okay. Um, so the whole situation is complex in, in evolving, it seems, too. Um, and there's other very relevant things here. So India gets its independence after 400 years from um, England, um, from Great Britain, and uh, puts up a constitution, and it outlaws this stuff. I mean, it's outlawing the whole idea of the untouchables. You know, and, and the year the constitution was in pl put in place was around the fifth, fifth, yeah, 1950. So, but <laughs> In 2001, India is saying we have 250 million untouchables. So it's not like the Constitution is necessarily being listened to. Well, surprise, in this country, it's not listened, our Constitution isn't always listened to, too. Okay? So things take time to change. Okay? The democracy in India, however, it, people, from my reading, is saying it's having a, a profound impact on, the, on these issues because these lower castes have numerical majority in quite a few areas and they they're having voice and they're changing things okay and so i the one uh, thing i read said look the caste system is basically going to die away for reasons like this because of democracy i mean india is the largest democracy in the world um and uh you know that's that's a fundamentally important thing i think for india in in my view anyway um so the Constitution also calls for equal pay, for equal work by women. But at the same time in society, I, I think it's pretty well known, just like for China, that a boy is valued much higher than a, a girl, baby girl. And, uh, you know, there are other mistreatments of women. Um, this baby issue, I, you know, I, I, it's pretty surprising the percentage now, if you take, like, kids under 15, and look at the percentage of girls and the percentage of boys. It's pretty surprising. Do you know it for India? But it, it, listen, it's not 50-50. It's, it's a pretty good skew towards boys. Ultrasound made a huge difference in India and in China. And so and this becomes a very complicated and controversial issue. Because, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, well, let's just leave it at that. It becomes very controversial. Okay? And... Uh, probably problematic for the country the countries in, in the long um, run. The other mistreatments of women, uh, I don't know if anybody here can comment on that, but there, you know, the things that I've, when I've talked uh, to people, yeah, there's, there seems to be a different level of, like, what's acceptable for a man to do to a woman on the street or to, you know, and... Uh, it's problematic, I think. I, th I think it's a serious issue from my reading. I don't know if anyone would like to comment. I've never been to India, so I, you know. Okay. Um, so that was it. I, I, if, before I start in the Islamic case, um, though, is there any comments? I mean, this case is, is quite complicated. Remember, there's 1.3 billion Indians, in people in India, uh, of India, um, ooh, there's a sizable number of Muslims in India, of course. Uh, do you know the percentage breakdown? They're considered a minority in India. Yeah. Um, but, but is it 20 percent? Yeah, maybe. But I, I think it's it's not not a minority anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. they're pretty big. Because they're they have bigger households. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, those things matter a lot. Yeah. Your fertility rates matter a lot on these issues, right? Okay. Uh, okay, thank you for the comments. Um, next, let's move to the Islamic case. Um, and I put the ethics quote there, recognizing that there's controversy over even use, use of the term social justice. So uh, I think it's good to start with a quote um, from the prophet Muhammad. Um, and this is, a, this is a pretty telling quote um, in terms of social justice. So no, he does not believe in Allah, nor in a day of judgment, he who eats his fill at night while his neighbors raked with hunger. I mean, that sounds pretty good, 
okay, uh, from many people's perspective, okay. Um, there are many misperceptions about what Islam stands for in the world today and for quite a few years, and um, that's a, it's a very complicated issue. It's a complicated issue for Americans in particular, but it's a complicated issue. Just look at what's been happening in Europe. Look what's been happening in the Middle East. It's all over. There's, there's a lot of complications on this point, okay, and where people stand. And I think that, you know, what's interesting is, is when people look at statements like this, they might be a little bit surprised, okay? Um, you know, contrast this with ISIS, okay? So, so um, I think it's good to keep an open mind here. Um, I'm going to um, do this. Uh, I, I like this video. Um, so I'm going to do this video. I've got the audio hooked up, and I'm actually going to turn up the volume. Oh, it's up. Let's hope the tech works here. Oh, <laughs> you know, why does that happen? Because when I... Miriam what? What was the next name? She's done a lot of stuff. So, uh, what was the name of the thing? Just a second. Inspired by. There it is. balance and I think that's what the prophet uh, the prophet's message peace be upon him it was fundamentally about having balance and equilibrium in all that we do uh, so that that was also something which was quite revealing to me uh, when I became a Muslim is that when we talk about justice uh, sometimes uh, our sense of justice can lead us to an injustice in the people who become the perpetrators who were the initial perpetrators of an injustice against us and the prophet, peace be upon him's message was always that you repel bad with good, that you always respond to evil with good, that you should always remember that God loves justice and never transgress the limits. So that even when people are committing serious injustices against you, even when the perpetrators may be responsible for heinous crimes, you have a moral responsibility and a moral obligation in front of God to always uphold justice and never yourself transgress those limits. When we look at the prophet, he, he wouldn't want to keep even a, an extra morsel of food in the house uh, out of fear that somebody else might be going without. Um, and that sort of utter devotion to ensuring that nobody was being deprived, that everybody was being cared for, uh, is something that if you do model yourself, as Muslims do, on, on the Prophet peace be upon him, you can't possibly be negligent uh, and ignore the real inequalities that continue to be rife in the world around us, whether it be in our community with a small c community in, a, in the bigger sense of society or in the world at large. Um, and I think that one of the things that certainly has uh, really stayed with me is that being a Muslim is, is to try and be the, the voice of the voiceless. Islam's beauty really comes into its own when it becomes manifest. And it becomes manifest when you make it into a tool, into a tool for the betterment of society, into a tool for the betterment of humankind and obviously fundamentally even beyond that a tool for making uh, the world a better place um, so the the ideal I think from an, uh, an Islamic perspective is for ethics to become lived ethics to become um, an applied body of values uh, and not remain uh, unfortunately as it often is cloistered in in, uh, in the mosque or or somewhere uh, which is somewhat divorced from reality I think the example of uh, Muhammad Yunus, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, who had developed um, an, a, an economic model uh, to uh, get communities out of poverty, is just one example of applied ethics. He took a, a principle, a principle that 
you know, people in poverty uh, had just as much right as anybody else to be given the economic means to uh, pull themselves out of poverty. And so he applied a principle, a principle of justice, and made it into uh, an economic model. And that's really lived Islam. That's really Islam in action. And when you see Islam in action, when you do see these principles translated into real world actions, then it's not only clear for us as a community to see, it's clear for the world to see. And obviously, there's not really a greater recognition than, than you know, being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. For me as a person, I, I, I can't possibly um, differentiate or distinguish between uh, me uh, and social justice. Social justice is an inherent part of being a Muslim and it's therefore it's an inherent part of me as a person. All right. Comments? Anybody? So what were her main points? Uh, it's, she said a lot. I think it's pretty contradictory what she said. Really, that like how? What's actually happening throughout the world? <laughs> because uh, yeah. she she talks about social justice and equality, and I don't think like in in most in many uh, Muslim countries, women are not treated equal to men, and I think they they have a caste system too, and there's a lot of division based on that, and there's a lot of discrimination again. So, I do agree to the point that she says that. Uh, none, none of the like your neighbor shouldn't sleep uh, hungry, yeah, because that is true. But when she talks about social <coughs> justice and just like every man should be treated equally, and that uh, that's just kind of contradictory to what's actually happening. It's a complicated issue. Um, I mean, I think I think it's very important to draw a distinction between um, what what a religion says how to interpret what is said, and then what's playing out. Because those can all be different things. So and I was putting this uh, together. I had a long talk with an uh, um, uh, Islamic scholar. And he, he is went into great detail about the problem of interpretation um, within Islam. And what he brought back is, is so there's the, the group that literally takes everything literally. Okay, and he said, "I am not one of those people. I am someone who interprets the context when the Quran was put together, the social context of that, which was a disaster. I mean, there was there was it was wars, killing like mad, social conditions horrible, and you know what happened then in response to that is, is he looks at it and says, okay, well for that social context, these are what the principles were." in applying, in, in, in terms of religion, in terms of the social context. But of course, today, it's a different social context, okay? At least in many contexts, to a great extent. So he says the fundamental conflict in Islam comes back to this issue, whether you're re willing to reinterpret or whether you're gonna put it to the word and go with it. And uh, you know, there's a lot of conflict then over, over the Sharia um, and uh, things like that. So um, I think the other thing, though, I would comment on is, is that you got to be careful with that kind of interpretation, I would say, because it's hard. There's, isn't it true, don't you think, that the news is like, is, is how many things are positive in the news? Just count them. Almost nothing. So all we do is report on bad things about each other all over the world, okay? And it gives you a huge misinterpretation of what's going on. So if you count the number of, of people, for instance, that are, terrorists relative to the bigger group, I think you're going to find really small numbers in, in the end, okay? And if you talk, and the same thing happens with the United States. If you, the interpretations I've seen from, from people from other countries, you know, okay, what they're saying is true for, you know, 1% of people. You know, but is that the big picture? No. So they, I think that's really dangerous. I, I'm sure with India, for instance, you know, you, you probably come across this here where there's some gross misinterpretations of what India is, right? And this, is, this is really unfortunate this goes on. I mean, it's a human tendency to stereotype in order to understand, right? I, 
I, th I think the major problem with, uh, I mean the major problem which Muslims are actually facing right now is lack of good quali leaders who can actually interpret Quran as what it is. And I'm just telling you something which I heard from my friend who is Muslim. So there, there are these schools which are exclusively made for Muslims. Where they Mothers. Their, yes, Mothers. Yeah. Yeah. So what they were teaching out there was Islam is the, it's, it's the best religion which anyone could have. Every person in this world is born a Muslim. And uh, a person who is not, not a Muslim are kafir or the rebels and they should be removed from this world. So if, if I think at the elementary level, if someone grows up with learning all that stuff, which is actually a misinterpretation of what Islam actually wants to convey, I don't think the, pro the condition is going to improve anywhere in the near future until and unless things like that are actually eradicated. Uh, well, things like how we educate our children is always controversial and uh, it does tend to perpetuate and things, that, but, but things can change too though. I mean, things, th I mean, you know, you could look at 100 years ago education in this country compared to now, we're talking about a vast difference, okay? So, and I know that everybody reinterprets history and I mean, all this is going on, it's, the world's chaos, you know? But you know, I tend to be an optimist to me about things like this. Maybe it's not well-founded, <laughs> but um, other comments? So a quick comment on Hinduism. Mm -hmm. You talked about the caste system, and mm -hmm. you said that Shudras are the ones who are exploited. Well, that, that's actually true. That's what it has happened in the past. But now the government has introduced so many reservations for the Shudras and so that they can actually come to a social equality somehow. This thing has actually misfired and led furthermore agitations. So uh, people are upset disturbing. because they're given advantages? Yes. Ah, the reason being, uh, I'm a Brahmin, so being born in the topmost caste, like according to the caste system, I'm not, I'm not allowed any kind of privileges and if all the resources are reserved for the people, <coughs> like almost 70% reservation is there in India. So if if I'm fighting for, say, a position, uh, uh, may, maybe a seat in a university, if I'm, if I'm writing an exam, I, I get higher marks than them. I get everything, I do everything better than them. Still, they get the position which I deserve. Wow. And it's like, you just have to, if, if you are into a reserved category, you just have to go and write the exam. Rest everything will do for you. So it's like, if you write the exam, you get the seat. Uh, this so, uh, yes. Um, actually, I, I, my family's from the same caste. We're, we're from the Brahmins. And uh, if you look at the brain drain that happened in the 80s yeah. um, from India specifically, like my parents came over in the 80s specifically for that reason, where they would go into a university exam and they would do well, but they couldn't get a seat. In you know the top universities in India, of which there were at that time very few. You know that it, it wasn't exactly undergrad in India was not, or grad school even was not even like. I mean, if you had money, you went to the states, um, and so they actually they came to the states for that reason because they said, well, there's no seat for us here at a good college, even though we're making the same marks as everyone else, and so it kind of there was actually quite a bit of backlash in India from the top cast because all of a sudden their work work wasn't recognized, so it's, it's, the intent was very good um, on the part of the government. I think that they, they wanted to do something to, to help raise up those, that caste system and to, to build a level of education for that caste system so that their children would have good, so that they would have jobs and that their children would have good education and, you know, to, to bring them out of poverty using education, but it backfired pretty badly and they ended up with a pretty nasty brain drain, so. It's, it's just like an interesting... Yeah, well, um, I think what I would like to do now is have, have you, uh, just a second, you two, you hear what they're saying. So, somebody from another country, sound familiar? Affirmative action. Uh, my dad was a blue collar steel mill worker, you know? And I mean, not him, but a lot of people that he would work with say, I applied for this job and 
they gave it to some black guy because I, you know, the affirmative action, they took my job. Um, no. and, th and this is going on today, too. Yeah. And, and this is going on today with respect to women. Okay? Um, and other underrepresented minorities. So what's right? It's a very difficult question. Yeah. Isn't it? One of the like ways that I tried to kind of justify it in a way um, is like say if say if you have a test you know and uh, going back to the caste system you know if a Brahmin scores 100 percent and somebody from the lower level scores 95, the Brahmin did better. They get they should get their seat, right? But isn't 95 percent good enough? And you know you should give them the opportunity. I agree to your point, yeah. but. 95% is not the case. It, yeah, I, 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 I'll tell you what. For uh, to get an admission into Indian Institute of Technology, yeah, you need to score somewhere around 180 out of 320, 60. I don't know. Like the time I gave, yeah, you have to score 180. And if you are say a, a scheduled tribe or a scheduled caste, the one who's in the reserve category, you need to score like 70. So that's, big differences. that's a lot of difference. Oh, it's a big difference. And, and, and that is why the country is not able to progress because the people who are holding the key positions are the <coughs> ones who are not, not qualified enough for that. I mean, oh, it's they, amazing, they, isn't they it? You have to play by the same rules. Like, if, if they want to make the line 70 for the lower caste, fine, but make that the line for everybody. Say, all you need is a 70. Oh, we don't have that many seats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that will just protect more people. Wow, well, that's what my Indian friends have always told me. You, he, he, I never forget what one Indian student said to me, Kevin, you're not getting it. We have a lot, a lot of people. This is like, here, it's like you feel like you got room. Right? No, my, my parents were like, so I, we, they bought a house that's too big for four people. Like they, uh, we, my brother and I have moved out, and they don't want to let go of this house because they're, they're just so excited that they have space. They're like, we want a yard. We want yeah. know, however many doors. We yeah. want a garage. We want all this stuff because they didn't have that back home. I've only had this sense one time. I was in Japan. It's like the oh, sea of people just everywhere. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. You know? And what was most shocking for me is walking down the street in Kobe. Um, I was a head taller than everyone. It's <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> the only time I felt tall. It's actually been 100 degrees and humid, and that's what it's like in India. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so there are similar things going on. Uh, we call it different stuff, caste system. Uh, affirmative action issues. There's, these issues are very difficult and controversial issues. It would be nice to think that we could always have a meritocracy, okay? Uh, meritocracy in particular in the university, which, you know, there's a lot of meritocracy, um, you know, in the university, but it's not entirely. I mean, it, not entirely. There are, there are, there's things that happen. Um, that are like um, this 70% compare 70 points versus 180 that go on right here at Ohio State. Okay, it's not that common, but that stuff's going on. And I don't know. I, I'm not one to argue against that, to be honest with you, for myself, because I find it so complicated. Because on the one hand, people have been wronged for centuries in many cases, and something has to change. Something you know, somehow. But yeah, the pendulum like swings the other direction. And it's like, you know, hurting other people then. It's really tough. Equality is a really a tough issue. I think the only line which, which could actually divide a society, which at, according to the present scenario, the one who you want to give reservations and the one who you don't want to give reservations are, can be based on the poverty level. Like if a person doesn't have that much of money, if he's, if he's provided some kind of aid, that's all right. No. But well, there's been efforts along those lines in the United States. There's a lot of effort to focus instead of uh, focusing on underrepresented minorities to focus on socioeconomic conditions only. And um, with respect to college admissions in particular, this has been a movement in the United States in the last 10 years. Yes. considered middle class in the states and like they don't have enough money to send me to college without loans or um, scholarships like I had to I'm paying my way through college with scholarships but 
when we did like FAFSA, um, if everyone remembers what FAFSA is, <laughs> um, that said that they should be paying something like $90,000 for my education. Like I wasn't getting a dime from the government because of need-based yeah. like, money, but, but that's because they set the bar like yeah. fairly low. Like if you have less than this, if you're making less than this amount, then you're not getting anything. Or you're getting something from the government. But if you're making more, then you're not getting a dime, even though you might still need like partial help. So I think it's it's dangerous to say that like. So what I'm talking about right now is not the financial assistance which you get from the government. I'm talking about the criteria. Like, say if if there's a person who actually has to work to earn some money so that he can survive, of course you cannot expect him to get like a hundred percent or like ninety five points out of hundred. So you can lower the bar for them. I mean, that's what I that's what I mean. I'm not saying about any kind of financial assistance, because if like th that's actually correct what you said. If the middle class will be the one who'll be suf who'll be suffering a lot because of that. But like, if if you actually want to bring the poor up to a level, they should have more access to the government jobs so that actually they can just come out of their poverty line and. It, it just all need to be monitored pretty, pretty like frequently. It's it's not that if, if a person was poor uh, two years ago, he may not be poor right now. So, so. yeah, and, and you know another thing I, that it continually is bothersome to me it, 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 with respect to this area is the issue of of using dollars to make decisions only. I mean, you know, listen, we learned early on in this class that it is not just money. It's not just the dollar twenty-five a day or whatever. Okay, poverty is not defined that way. Most people don't. It's more like HDI, Human Development Index, Education, Health, and Income. And so, if you could use a more uh, multi-dimensional approach, I think you're going to come up with a better, better way to cope with all this. The problem is, is measuring the information, getting honest information from people, etc., so they make these simple, sweeping things. And I think there are problems with them. Okay, um, I'm going to go on. Uh, so in the Quran, um, it speaks against social and economic injustices and calls for elimination. It allows for the ownership of property and accumulation of wealth. That's a very important issue. Okay, so it would be then <coughs> opposed to communism, Marxism, Mar in its Marxist original Marxist form. Provided the wealth is shared with the rest of society and especially with the poor. Muslims must share because what they share is not their own, but God's. So this should remind you of the Catholic case a little bit. Yes? Doesn't it seem like there's a contradiction in that one bullet point? Which one? This one? Yes. It allows for the accumulation of wealth as long as you share it. Well, yeah, it's just like the Catholic case, right? What Catholic case is very contradictory. Yeah. I mean, because it says <laughs> it says that it, 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 it what, what was the words? Um, universal destination of goods says everybody gets everything equally, but... You have private property, and if you have a lot, you have, are obliged to help. You're obliged to help more, and if you're really, really poor, then they have they call it the preferential option for the poor. So essentially, saying the wealthy must help all the poor. So, so there is a very much a conflict in here, and it's it's complicated. But you know, this is similar statement conceptually. I don't think they're identical, but I mean. And they are conflictual. I think it's intentionally that way. Yes? How did you replace the word welfare with HDI? You mean, where, where at? Where do you mean? Um, oh, you mean? Yeah, there. So it's not individual wealth, but the wealth of society. Interesting. You know, on average. Yeah. You know, in these, in these, see, the problem is, is that what I find in my reading about religions is, is these people don't define their terms. What does wealth mean? People look at it and think it's money. But then when you, you, if you read the Catholic case, when I went back there, I'm like, well, no, actually, they don't mean that. It means knowledge, skills, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, for instance, in the, um, in the Christian case, um, Jesus said something like, okay, the poor will always be with us. So this is really bothersome for some people, okay? Um, because, well, if the poor will always be with us, what are we doing here? We're not going to fix the problem, you know? But 
the question is, is what did he mean? What, how do you define poor? And is, does that mean poor spiritually? Does it mean poor in, in lack of love? Does it mean, I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's really not clear to me what that word means. And in these contexts, when I read the, the, any of the other cases, I have the same problem. I mean, the Muslim case too, because what does wealth mean? What does share mean? And then what does poor mean? I mean, for me, it's not clear. Now, now a scholar in you know, Hinduism or Islamic scholar might be able to say, no, Kevin, this, it means this, okay? But when I read my reading, I'll see these definitions. Okay, so the Quran, um, interestingly, prescribes that Muslims take um, their zakat, or almsgiving, to fulfill one of the mandated five pillars of Islam. So this is quite interesting. This, is a, a, this says that, that um, almsgiving, or, which a lot of people would use the word charity, is required of a Muslim, period, okay, uh, as one of the five pillars. All right, this is not like some kind of optional thing. Um, it, it's, it's a very strong mandate. If, the, if you're a Muslim, you should give to others. Um, so the Quran uh, promoted social justice in, in difficult times when it was put together and uh, equality and human rights in Islam. And Islam comes out and says that Justin claims that justice and equality is for everybody, not just them. Um, it's regardless of ethnic, racial, or religious backgrounds. Okay, this is a very broad view. You can contrast that with the Jewish case, which is, is compl more complicated in this respect. Um, some, there's the universalistic and um, particularistic perspectives which say how the justice perspectives apply. Do they apply only to Jews? Or do they apply to all of humanity? Okay, and there's controversy even today over that issue in the Jewish faith, where Islam comes out and says, no, this is for everybody, okay? Um, so the message of the Quran teaches that both wife and husband have equal rights and should exercise these rights to serve each other and maintain justice and peace. Okay, now this is one, I'm re and this is an Islamic scholar I'm reading who says this, okay? You, you may have disputes over the exercise of this, but so Muhammad realized that no society is, is viable where women do not enjoy rights as well as duties. Um, but of course, those issues are debated today. Um, now, with respect to humanitarian engineering, I, I want to try to tie uh, an idea from humanitarian engineering into what we just discussed. Remember, in the uh, Catholic case, I used the example of preferential option with respect to technological capacity. That is, we're the we have great technological capacity because we're all engineers, and we have to help people without technological capacity because there's this great inequality between the two. So the relevance to some of our discussions um, today is this issue of engineering volunteerism. Now, engineering volunteerism says that you freely give away your help, gratis, okay? Unpaid, no course credit, you're just doing it for free. A lot of this is going on in the College of Engineering via the OSU student organizations. They're not getting, a, they're not getting course credit for that. They're helping out the local community with engineering service. Okay, so this is going on. Um, so the question is, is, should we require it in the College of Engineering? Everybody has to do, by mandate, X hours of engineering service work for the community. What do you think? Yes. <clears throat> I would support it. I think it's great. Um, I think you'll get a lot of pushback from people talking about freedom and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so it's the kind of same debate nationally about civic service, about whether or not people should be required to do a year of civic service between, you know, like, it, it is, and it's the same well, issue. But, it's the same issue, yeah. And uh, I would also support that, but you get the same argument. Yes. Um, I would say no because we require someone to give away their time. That's like the, the two words require them freely. Those are contradicting each other directly. Um, in high school, I, I went to Catholic schools. A lot of the schools around me had a required service hours to do. It's a school requirement. Mine didn't. 
and I see I saw like a lot of people that in my school they seem to get a lot more out of it, and they would gave a lot more than other schools. So because they because the uh, because yours wasn't forced to, was, and they were forced. Yeah, because sometimes it just seems like a box check, and like not gonna give your all, and just like oh I did it, I'm done. I see. But otherwise, you want to do it because you want to do it, and you give your all of it. Other comments? Yeah. I mean, I think you get a lot of backlash from, like, people maybe arguing, like, oh, you know, I'm working on this. If I'm required to do this, I don't have as much time to, like, you know, maybe research something I'm working on or work on something. And then, like, they might argue that like, that's how they're contributing, whereas they might not be, like, directly. So, yeah. There's very pro if, if you were to implement something like this, it would be highly problematic, Okay. Besides people just ignoring it and protesting and, you know, it would be very problematic. Yes? What lawyers have to do? Like ah, very good. You're good. So you're, you're right where I'm going. So lawyers um, under the American Bar Association are required to do, um, a, no, a strive to achieve the goal of 50 hours pro bono publico services per year. Okay? That's sort of in our constitution and everything because it, it, the people that can't pay for lawyer is supposed to get free help. Where is it going to come from? So lawyers have very strong requirements on that, and they do it. I've had lawyer friends do this kind of stuff. In the medical profession, the American Medical Association, AMA, um, they have some pretty strong statements back down from the lawyers about the same thing, about free help in a clinic, etc. Next, if you go to the engineering codes of ethics, they're all over the board. Some of them don't mention it. Some say you should try to do it. It's all over the board, really it is. We're gonna come back to that issue um, um, later on with respect to the secular um, piece. I think a crucial issue though in the conflict that I think um, has to be acknowledged is a blanket rule, in my view, is wrong. Blanket. Because, look, um, let's say you have a physical or mental disability and then you, you you force something like this on people. Make them feel bad about not doing it. They have to get an exemption or they can't do it. Or what if you have a family to take care of and your child is, is disabled? Okay? I mean, how can, you how can you force things on people like that? I just, to me, it's, it's, it, people have priorities and, and uh, things that they, responsibilities, very serious responsibilities. So it's hard for me to see how you could really implement it um, because you'd have all these exemptions. I don't know. I think it's complicated. I, I, I've, I've heard people all over the board on this. I mean, from you know, must happen, you know, to, to no way and, and, you know. But, you know, if you think about this issue, it's actually related to many, many things in social justice. For instance, think of the system of taxation, for instance, in this country. We're forced to pay taxes. We get thrown in jail if we don't. And guess what? In, in some states and in the federal system, it's progressive taxation. So that means I'm required to help pay for poor people. Okay? How's that different than giving your, being forced to give your time? You tell me. I mean, time is money. Money is time. So by being taxed at a higher, higher rate, I'm being forced to do something maybe I don't want to do. Maybe I have extra expenses, yes. I think you're uh, equating time and money at the same time. It's not a good equality because uh, money, no matter if it's forced or not forced, is going to be the exact same. Money is going to be money no matter what. But time, it's going to be... I, you're right, you're right. Granted, you're right. Because, because of different earning potentials, many for many reasons. But I think you get my point. The abstract point is, is that how can we force each other to do that? And yet, in a lot of ways, we support it. Many people, it's amazing people support it. Except for, well, the libertarians, but the extreme libertarians, you know, might not support that. Um, and the, the, the states that have regressive taxation, in other words, they tax their poor more than their rich. That's happened in the United States, too. Okay? So, um, then everybody knows it. It happens. It's just... You know, we don't want to admit such stuff, but that's, that's the reality. Um, but, but this issue is I use just as a point of, of discussion to think about equality and 
forcing to give things. And, you know, another way to ask a question, for instance, is I had a woman raise her hand last year during this discussion. She said, I think this course should be required of all engineering students, period, to graduate. I was like, wow, great, come give me a hug. Um, but, you know, I, I actually disagree with her. I mean, I, I did. I, I said, uh, no, I, you can't do something like that, you know. She had this view that engineers were too um, much like this in their thinking. You know, she wanted people to be more like this. I understand her point, but to force something like that, I, I'm not comfortable with, yes. I mean, we already have the engineering ethics. I feel like that was required when I was an undergrad, isn't it? Okay, so the engineering ethics is required of all by um, all majors by um, ABET mm -hmm. for accreditation. However, in in most of the majors, it's not given much attention. Yeah, but if we, if you could fix that. You know, you said you mentioned lawyers and doctors have their degrees that mandate this stuff. There were a unified engineering code that mandated it to be worked in. You know, humanitarian work to be worked into the engineering ethics course. Yeah. Um, you know, I've taught it, the engineering ethics in, in ECE since 91, and uh, it's a complicated issue. You know, I studied a lot, and the problem is, it, it comes down to is, is the, the attitudes of, um, well, I want to come back to that next week, okay? Because that issue I've studied quite a bit, and uh, what happens in the end, just as an overview, on. Um, it's very hard to get agree agreement on a code of ethics. Furthermore, there's been an attitude in the United States um, about our codes of ethics, engineering, that they are universally applicable, the whole world. And it's, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, it, it, they don't often apply to many other countries. And so now there's a little bit of turmoil gener being generated in engineering ethics area because there's, people are realizing, well, crap, uh, you know, this doesn't really work in Japan or whatever. Um, I'm picking that case carefully because that's a real different case. So uh, the universality of something like ethics is, is, seems impossible. The universality of a system of social justice is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. I mean, look at the diversity we've already seen. Just in three cases, right? Wow. There's a lot of different conceptions of justice. So what do you do with all this disagreement? What you say is, is well, if I go to India, I ought to know what their system is. If I go to Latin America, I ought to know what their system is, et cetera. If I go to Islamic country, I ought to know. And whether you agree or disagree with it, and of course, you're not going to go to a country like this and you know, go to Honduras and say, you Catholics are nuts. You're, not gonna dis you're just going to live with it and try to understand it as a cultural issue. You have to respect it. Because it's a very it's a very important thing for many individuals what they believe in the religion you just don't you know go with it okay um, the other cases um, I got one minute okay the other cases I cover in the book are <laughs> Buddhism Confucianism uh, and, uh, the Jewish case um, and every one of them is different okay they all have interesting features. What I have found most fascinating, however, is the similarities in some cases. And the one thing I have found in all the secular and religious cases is some kind of a statement about helping the weakest and the worst cases out. It, it, I've seen it all, all through it. I don't care what of these religions this is, what secular perspective. People say it different. They say it with different strengths. They make it a pillar of Islam, whatever it is. But it's there. It's there every time, okay? Which is pretty fascinating, actually. I mean, that, that's, that's quite a statement um, overall. So we'll, we're going to come to this next week. We're going to talk about John Rawls, sort of a political view of uh, social justice. And then Marsha Sen, the Indian, um, famous Indian economist and uh, philosopher. And then we'll do engineering ethics, okay? Um, and that has many points of relevance to humanitarian engineering. Okay, after 